Well, welcome everybody to Hydroterra's Tech Talk. Uh, these tech talks are where we talk more about a specific technology rather than so much about a broader scale webinar, which talks more about uh, issues and things that are out there. So today we're talking about innovative groundwater and geotechnical solutions, exploring micro seismic resonance and willow stick technologies. We're joined by Mitchell Green, who's a geologist with Willow Stick. In fact, he's the chief geologist there and myself, managing director of Hydroterra. Thanks for joining us today, Mitch. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. There's a picture of Mitch, and hopefully you can also see him on your screens. A little bit about our presenter. So Mitch trained recently at, at a wonderful university in Las Vegas. So they do have universities at Las Vegas and he trained trained as a More geologist. Than just casinos. <laughs> and, a, <laughs> and a geophysicist. And uh, he was chief, he is currently chief geologist at Willow Stick, where he helps to manage the company's global operations, as well as overseeing their data modeling and advancements in research and development. He's been with Willow Stick since 2019. Mitch has brought a wealth of experience from his previous work in mineral exploration within the mining industry in the United States. As an Australian-American, Mitchell splits his physical time between the US, Australia and Brazil. He's educated as a structural geologist, he is also proficient in the various advanced technologies utilised by Willow Stick. A little bit about Hydroterra's involvement with Willow Stick. So we've been working with Willow Stick for must be nearly 10 years now and undertaken uh, several different uh, Willow Stick surveys, um, looking at underground seepage from tailings, dams and uh, reservoirs, as well as um, some contaminated site sort of investigations of seepage pathways and that side of things. So it's been a great... Uh, relationship that we've had with Willow Stick over those years. We love your questions and in this particular format we're going to try and answer the questions as they come up um, because they'll be a bit more specific to the moment than a webinar. So please feel free to type your Q&A, so type into the Q&A and I'll read those questions out to Mitch as we go. Let's see how we go with that. Why does Hydroterra do these tech talks? Well, we love to share knowledge. Uh, we like to facilitate education and we'd like to be an industry leader by working with the best technology providers. And today we have Willow Stick performing that role. All right, so without further ado, I'll pass over to Mitch, who's beaming in all the way from Las Vegas, I'm assuming, Mitch. And uh, hopefully our internet connections keep working reliably, but over to you, Mitch. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you having me here. Uh, hopefully all goes well on the internet side of things. I think we got that ironed out previous to it, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited to share. Um, honestly, so we've only been taking MSR or microseismic resonance, which is kind of the first thing we'll talk about on the road for uh, probably only the last couple months. Uh, we've been using it with our clients in the past uh, since probably 2020 or so. Uh, to various degrees and various applications, um, but it's kind of been something we've been running in stealth mode. Uh, so only this year we've really taken that on the road and started to market it more publicly. Um, also helps that the patents have uh, gotten approved, so we can start talking about this a little bit more openly. Uh, but I'd love to share a, a project we did actually in Brazil uh, right around the time we started using this more aggressively uh, in 2020. Um, so this is a pretty interesting application uh, for a first application in the geotechnical sense. So a, a little bit of background on microseismic resonance is we designed it to supplement our existing technology. So 
initially, uh, the company's been around for almost 21 years at this point. And uh, it was solely using the Willis Dick method, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, but that's an electrical based technique and that has its shortfalls. Uh, it's very good at what it does, mapping seepage in three dimensions. Uh, but it doesn't really tell us the media in which, you know, that seepage is flowing. Uh, it's not very good at characterizing the subsurface. So we personally needed a tool and that's where we developed MSR out of. Um, so what it allows us to do, microseismic resonance, is we're essentially listening to noise. Uh, some will call it earth noise or microseismic. Uh, but we're listening to the acoustics of the earth, um, stuff that's already there. And then we're doing a whole bunch of back-end post-processing and we're pulling out usable information. Now that usable information includes things like uh, bedding interfaces between different lithologies, but also it can help us understand some of the physical properties, right? So these different layers have different acoustical properties. So depending on how we process that data, we can understand physical properties. Uh, most notably relative resonance, which is a very high degree of correlation with relative porosity. Uh, not so much permeability, but more so porosity. So this is a really good example to talk about. Uh, this site covers 37 hectares. Um, it's an ammonia plant that turns uh, that ammonia into fertilizer. Um, you can also see in the top left of that figure, uh, this sits on a river. So the unfortunate side of things is when this plant was constructed a couple of years ago, or a few years prior to our investigation in 2022, uh, there wasn't a lot of oversight. Um, in fact, you can see the SM series of boreholes that are within that kind of red polygon. Those are the only diamond boreholes that were done for a depth to bedrock, and those were done after the issue started to arise. So the very simple geology of this site is we have about uh, 10 or 15 meters of overburdened fluvial deposits, so sands and gravels, and then beneath that is a massive block of limestone. Now, as it turns out, that huge block of limestone is full of caves. So what they were having as their issue on site, uh, if you, as you can imagine, if you have essentially Swiss cheese underneath, every time they get a, a large you know, downpour of rain, essentially all the small sediments within that fluvial overburden get sucked down into, or they settle down into rather, uh, the karstic material underneath. So they, they had two big issues. You know, where, where is that bedrock interface? And then also where, where's the caves underneath? And all of this had to be done while not interrupting production. Um, so this is where microseismic has another strong strength is we don't really have any geophone arrays when we're setting this up. Um, I believe actually the next slide has an actual image of our, of our equipment and what that looks like. So this is uh, a very early production. This is actually the version we used on the site. Um, so it's our patented uh, sensor, geophone, and then we have the analog to digital converter. Uh, and then in this case, we are using a small little Windows tablet to do data collection. These days, um, pretty much everything on the left, so the sensor and the analog converter, that's sitting in a, a nice little thing. I don't actually have one of the new prints we've done, but that sits inside of something about the size of a soda can that has an RTK module in it and that just sits on the ground. So we're not limited by, you know, a large geophone array because we're physically taking our instrument, the, uh, the MSR instrument, from location to location to take a measurement versus setting up an array and collecting all the data at once. Uh, so we can jump over to the next slide. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. I don't want, you know, microseismic resonance to be something that's seen as a magic black box that data goes in and somehow results come out. Um, it's, it's really through, uh, depending on, you know, your background level of physics and how you think about the world, but we're essentially understanding, um, acoustics and what, how MSR works, unlike traditional reflective seismic or, um, uh, different seismic techniques that are out there. We're actually using P waves instead of S waves, which is a lot of what other seismic instruments use. So what we're doing is we're relating frequency to depth. Um, and that's actually what this equation talks about here. Now, a good way to think about it is, uh, I'll have a glass of wine with me now. If you, if you drink wine or another beverage, uh, you can understand that if you have a glass of wine that's maybe about halfway full and you hit the side of that glass, you will get one, uh, one tone that is correlative to how much fluid's in there. And depending if you drink more or pour more in your glass, you're going to get a different tone. 
Um, now, if you kind of keep that mindset, what we're essentially doing is based on the wavelength of the frequency. So, you know, high frequencies having very short wavelengths and long frequencies having very long wavelengths, uh, where if you tilt that on its side, if we have ground surface here and a, a wavelength that forms a standing wave between, say, the surface and our bedrock interface, then it's going to be one frequency. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, if we kind of keep that mindset, and we apply a, a Fourier transformation. Now, now, what that is, is essentially you take all the noise, all the sounds that are in the ground. Um, so that would be on the top right there. So F1, F2, that is all that background noise. The Fourier transformation will take that out and break it out into its constituent components. So all the individual frequencies that make up the noise. And then we can understand based on how long our record window is, how far those sounds are coming from. So if we take all that raw data, I'll go to the next slide here, um, we can actually start to understand quite a bit. So this is actually within that red polygon that we showed on that kind of overview of the site. So this is that large ammonia storage tank where the sinkhole is. Now, those nine kind of pink uh, dots on the bottom, those are just a, a small sample of the over 2,000 shots we did uh, for this investigation. So all the shots were done on about a 10 meter grid. Uh, which is pretty powerful because we can actually process that grid data separately. But that data we're processing if, uh, on the next slide, that is actually coming from these individual shots. So this is, um, if you're a computer, this is what MSR data looks like once it's processed. Um, Microseismic data that we process, it's not um, mechanical information uh, so much that you might get from a cone push test. Uh, but what this is, is acoustic information. So the way to look at these graphs, and they're actually the same graph, uh, the one on the left is just a standard graph, the one on the right is actually plotted in log. But uh, what we're looking at is essentially, based on those formulas and the back-end process, at what depth are we getting standing waves is essentially what this boils down to. So if you look at the one that's not in log on the left, uh, you can see there's a really strong signal at around 40 meters. That is the bedrock interface trapping a standing wave between the surface and the bedrock. Um, actually, as well, you can see around the 20 to 23 meter deep, uh, that's actually a gravel lens. Um, and I can tell you that those are the bedrock and the gravel lens because this was an R&D project for us uh, back when we did this. And uh, those five diamond boreholes that were done uh, were actually done for comparison. So we have logs to compare that to. So, we jump over to the next slide. So that, that's what the raw data looks like. But uh, if we if we take that data set and we take a step back and we're not dealing with nine shots, we're dealing with 12,000 shots. So uh, this is actually modeled in LeapFrog. Um, you could probably use other programs if you wanted to, but if we skip over to the next one, um, I'll go a little fast through these. Um, so if any Q and A questions come up, type them in. But uh, the, the way that we handle this, if you imagine, so we had that graph before, of those nine points that were sampled. Now, if you remember, around 40 meters, we had that bedrock interface. So that bedrock interface and the color scale applied to these shots is that kind of red lens that you can see through the data. Uh, so through some numerical modeling, we can actually pull that out of the data set. So if we go over to the next slide, um, you can we basically just apply an iterative model. Um, I don't like saying AI because everyone wants to use it as a hotkey, but we're doing some advanced iterative modeling. Uh, for numerical models, and we're able to pull out the bedrock interface. So this is just a, a quick little overview and a comparison for the bedrock interface to the diamond boreholes. Uh, we can actually skip over to the next one and just remove the MSR data from it. Now, there's five diamond boreholes. We were 99% accurate on three of them. Two of them we were not accurate on, and it bothered me for the longest time until we did a little bit more digging. And looking back at this, um, our actually our iterative model has changed. I don't think we were sensitive enough on you know how how much we were letting that uh, algorithm crawl through the data and get some ups and downs. So I think it's a little bit mute, uh, especially in areas between shots, right? So we did this on a 10 meter grid. So our vertical accuracy where a shot is is really high. Uh, but when we're you know within that 10 meter space in between shots, that's up to the computer to interpret as best it can. So in terms of the ones that did match, the three of the five, uh, we were off by about 30 centimeters at a depth of that around 40 meters. So about that 99 percentile of accuracy. Uh, so we can jump over to the next one. Um, this is kind of just a, a representation of, you know, 
what that bedrock surface loots like. If you're at all familiar with karstic geology, uh, this is what you kind of expect. So you can see those five diamond boreholes uh, right here, uh, the SM series, so SM one through five, that's right under our ammonia tank. And then uh, what we're looking at on the color scale here is actually the uh, dip angle of those different uh, parts of the, of the surface. So, you know, you can see we have little sinkhole features. We have uh, essentially highs and valleys, which is very typical of karstic terrain. So well, at this point, we're kind of on the right track, um, kind of walking you through our methodology. So if we go to the next slide here, um, we kind of answer question number one, where's the bedrock interface? So this is a bedrock contour map, um, taking that surface out of leapfrog and processing that out and just making a nice colored raster. Um, and this kind of answers question number one, where is that bedrock interface? What does it look like? Uh, essentially a geometric characterization of the subsurface using just MSR. And this is probably a good point too to mention. So the 2000 shots or 2300, I think it was exactly, uh, that we collected using that instrument. So we actually used two on site um, and for the depth of investigation. So this is about a hundred meters deep uh, from surface to our cutoff of data. Um, based on how the math uh, levels out, we have total data down to hundred meters. We have the highest resolution on the upper 60 meters. Uh, we start to lose resolution with depth. Um, for that type of situation, it takes about 10 seconds uh, for each shot on the data acquisition side. Um, and again, if we think back to those formulas, so that's 10 seconds per shot because we're limiting our record window. If we expand our record window, of course, the record time increases, um, sometimes in excess of two minutes, but it also allows us to record deeper as well. Um, so for example, uh, we're doing a lithium exploration project in Western Nevada right now, and that is consistently down below 2000 meters. And then we're also working in the oil industry. Actually, it's for uh, carbon sequestration. So uh, essentially carbon graveyards for CO2. And those are down around three to 4,000 meters. Um, so it just depends on how long or how much your operators like you are willing to sit there for three minutes in the cold. So that kind of answers question number one. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, we can kind of walk through some of the, some of the bad parts, right? So I, I told you we didn't match all of them. Uh, so this is taking a cross section. So those boreholes form an X. So this is going, um, I believe this one is going from Northwest to Southeast. And these are the two boreholes that didn't match. So S and one and five. Now through the logs, we knew that it wasn't just the standard pretty picture. Uh, these, these logs here are simplified. So the yellow is fluvial deposits and the blue is limestone. Now I can tell you from the logs themselves, SM1 and SM5 had fluvial deposits, somehow limestone, and then fluvial deposits again, and then back into limestone with micro uh, macro pores. So if we go, uh, and the one on the right is the one that matched, you know, 99% accurate, we'll just skip. So that's SM5 again, uh, flanked by the, uh, the two that matched again. So three total. Now, again, SM5 was more anomalies in how the borehole data was collected. And I'll address this and why this didn't match and why we've changed our algorithm here. So if we go over to the next one, so that's kind of question number one, where's that bedrock surface? Question number two, where's the caves within that bedrock surface? So depending on how the MSR is processed, I can pull out, like I showed you in that graph, where the standing waves are being concentrated or where they're being sourced from, you can think of it that way. Now, if we take that uh, similar to how the log view works, or we call that the full spectrum data set, and that's a collection of zones within that MSR shot. It's almost like a, a laser beam straight down. It's actually conical, but it, for all intents and purposes, it's straight down. That's more of a collection of where are all these resonance frequencies concentrated from. And that's actually what this shows. So red being higher relative resonance, and then yellow, finally it's blue, being less resonance. Um, now, relative resonance, for the most part, is very correlative to uh, relative porosity. Um, not so much permeability, it's, it's almost impossible to measure per on test, uh, but it's essentially Perme uh, porosity. So if you're doing investigations at hard rock, that's very good at showing you zones that might have fractures or secondary fractures. In fact, uh, Hydroterra did a really good job uh, in Sydney um, for a gas station that had some very shallow investigation, but it was only about 10 meters deep, uh, but it was all for secondary porosity due to micro fractures for a, a contaminated site project. So it's, it's good at showing data like this. But if you can imagine, MSR is a ton of 
areas of higher porosity, a cave is just an area of really high porosity. So if we switch over to the next slide, I can build another numerical model around the areas of highest porosity. Um, so if we switch over to the next one, that, that's what this is. It's essentially we've uh, rendered out isosurfaces around the areas where the porosity is highest. So if we switch over to the next slide, um, that's essentially this. Now, for the good part is, um, naturally, all our data for high porosity zones is underneath the bedrock surface, which is what we expect. Um, you can actually see there's some exceptions to that rule, uh, especially kind of on the right side of the screen that uh, does stick above the bedrock surface. But for the most part, without any trickery or filtering, all of our caves essentially are under the bedrock. So that's good. That's what we expected to see. Um, and, and now we can start to go into a more advanced geometric characterization of the site. So we can flip over to the next slide here and essentially, you know, we'll take out the bedrock surface for now, but this is according to the MSR data where we likely have cavities in that bedrock surface. Um, so we'll jump over to the next one here. Now this is, this is where the, you know, this is where it starts to get interesting. So this is essentially, you know, the answer to question number two, where's the caves? Now, the interesting thing is we don't really have a very good way to validate, at least we didn't at the time, um, to validate if those caves actually exist. Um, today, I can tell you, we'll spoil it a little bit, the cavity feature under the ammonia tank itself, they've actually since drilled into and filled full of cement. But if we jump over to the next slide, at the time, you know, it was R&D. So we had the borehole data to compare for the bedrock surface, which we were, I would say, satisfactory. And then we needed another method to compare if there was cavities or not. So while we remember still, uh, the client we're working for, Unishell, they actually hired a, a third-party firm to come out and do a gravity assessment. So if we jump over to the next slide here, uh, what we essentially do is we take their gravity data. Now, in this part of the world, in Brazil, it's very common to use gravity data to look for karstic features. Uh, same for Mexico, actually, and a lot of Central and South America. So the logic behind this is the blue zones are, well, the blue and the green, actually, are areas of low gravity or essentially low density. So you can think of that as open rock or void space. And then the kind of oranges and pinks, those are higher density. Therefore, those are areas of solid rock. I'll point out a couple key features here because what we're going to do is those volumes that we render out in leapfrog through some numerical models are, we can actually overlay those on the 2D map. Now, in this gravity study here, you can see there's almost kind of a, a linear feature that goes from about northwest to southeast. Um, and then there's almost a, a donut shaped feature in the northwest corner. Uh, I guess that'd be the kind of the western corner. Uh, where we have green surrounding kind of red. And then also we obviously have the blue anomaly on kind of the, the bottom half of that data set. So if we go to the next slide and we overlay our MSR volumes on top of this, you can see that there's actually a relatively good degree of correlation. Now, there's that same linear feature we were seeing that kind of cuts down the, the middle lengthwise of that uh, study. And you can also see we're seeing that same donut feature. Now, you can see our donut feature on the MSR data has like a little knot in the middle of it. Um, I'll have to show you what that is because unlike the gravity study, we're dealing with a three-dimensional data set. So you can also see we have anomaly also where the caves are allegedly in the gravity data. But if we jump over to the next slide, because I'm dealing with a three-dimensional data set, uh, I guess the next, next slide, um, because we're dealing with a three-dimensional data set, I can actually take that model from plan view and I can, uh, sorry, from map view, and I can turn it into plan view. So if we jump over to the next one, what we're essentially looking at is a cross section in three dimensions of where those caves are underground. Now, the cool thing is, is the gravity study says, hey, you got a huge low gravity anomaly on the bottom right of that study. Well, if we look at the MSR data, it's just because that gravity anomaly or that cave is closer to the bedrock surface in that area. So it's not necessarily that there's a bigger cave or a bigger opening. And it's just more so that that's closer to the surface and shows and presents as a larger anomaly. So uh, we were very happy with this result and how we could characterize this in three dimensions. And actually, so was the client. And you can actually see our donut feature, that little knot that's in the bottom is significantly deeper. It's almost on the bottom of the screen. So that's, that's why that shows in that data set. But uh, all right, so that's kind of question one and two. Bedrock surface, caves. 
So let's jump over to the next slide and we'll address those two boreholes that didn't match. So again, we'll pull that bedrock surface back in. And actually here, I'll pause for a second. So you can see if we follow the trend between SM15 and two, uh, you can see there's almost a, a linear uh, trend or a pothole anomaly. So if we go over to the next slide, what we're looking at is a, a top-down view. So here's those same SM series of holes. And again, we're going from one, five, and two. One and five being the two that didn't match. But you can see spatially, if we go on the bedrock surface alone, those are pretty close to being within areas where the bedrock surface has some dips in it. So if we go to the next slide, what we're doing is we're going to turn that bedrock surface more transparent and look along that linear anomaly. We can see that beneath those essentially divots in that bedrock surface, that's where the caves are as well. So what we believe happened in this case, uh, because I can tell you the caves are there because they've since been drilled into, I just don't think our algorithm was sufficient for the amount of change we had vertically across that bedrock surface. We are capturing some of the sinkholes in that bedrock surface, but I think in actuality, it's just a much more significant opening into the cave below. Um, so we sense change our modeling algorithm on how we address that, but uh, that is the failure. And I believe that's how uh, we've captured that failure, uh, but I think we've since remedied that. So that's kind of essentially how we use MSR on a more uh, geometric site characterization. And like I said too, it wasn't necessarily designed for that, um, but that's uh, turned out to be something it's very good at. So let me jump over to the next one. But it's a good time for questions usually too or something. Yeah, Mitch, I've got a question. So with this particular site, you've since gone back and revisited the, the data algorithm and now you're sort of getting caves where caves would be and, and the ground surface. But how how site specific is that um, that adjustment to the algorithm, um, or do you really think it's going to nail it across all different sorts of lithology? Yeah, I don't know if you want to go back all all the way to the beginning, but essentially what's happened is um, I can tell you why the algorithm failed. If you want to scream through the slides back to the beginning where we had those graphs, but if you we remember that at the end. <laughs> Okay, no worries. But if you remember, we sampled those nine points. Uh, this is actually where our algorithm failed. It was just too simple. So we sampled those nine points. And you remember, we had a couple that were almost clear across the screen. Uh, those are really, really strong values. So our algorithm uh, at that point wanted to really attach itself to those strong values. And it statistically was discounting the weaker ones from the shots that didn't have as high of a return. So I believe what's happened is it was discounting too many of those points because those were within that kind of you can almost call it a gray area within the sinkholes themselves where the bedrock surface was kind of undefined. And it was attaching itself to the strong bedrock anomalies, but it wasn't necessarily answering to the, the ones that were a bit more, say, weathered or a little bit more within the sinkholes themselves. So that, that's what we've changed since then. Okay. I'll just see if there's any questions on the Q&A. No, no Q&As at the moment. Come on, team. Okay. Shall I move yeah, to surely the, the feature we can? Yeah, surely the feature we can pick on people at random, bring back some trauma from uh, school days. Okay, so that was a very complicated application of MSR, and I, I, I maybe should have started with this, but I know that one usually keeps people awake. So this is a, a very small application, and this is what actually what we tried to use MSR for initially. Um, so this is for well sightings. And this is a very simple example, but we can go more complex if need be. Um, so we can jump over to the next slide. This is just more location. This was in uh, Utah, where we do uh, quite a bit of work in the Western US. And the whole purpose of these investigations is, given my property boundaries, where is the best spot for me to put a well? So, um, so this is very small. It's 40 acres, which I believe is 20 hectares. I, I'm a, don't quote me on the math. My brain either works in metric or imperial, and I, I hate the imperial system. So uh, the, the way this works is, you know, we're given 40 acres, but oftentimes if we're doing something on the scale for a municipality, it could be 4,000 acres. And obviously, you know, MSR is really good for a lot of things, but you don't want to necessarily do an MSR grid across, you know, 40,000 hectares. That's just not time efficient. It's also too expensive. So we try to leverage another technology. So you can jump over to the next slide. And that, this kind of gets into technology number two. Now, our gamma scintillation, um, which is a very fancy way of saying we're measuring gamma radiation, uh, it's almost entirely used solely to supplement MSR 
for the purpose of looking for groundwater wells. Um, so when we're, we're looking in this space, we're using gamma scintillation. Uh, I won't talk about it here, but we also uh, have recently, probably in the last six months, started using photogrammetry as well. Um, and what that does is uh, together, and the gamma is very good at it, is gamma will give us relative soil moisture content. The way that works is gamma radiation itself is present in pretty much every earthen material from you know sedimentary deposits all the way up to volcanics in varying different degrees. Now, the interesting thing is, is uh, gamma radiation itself is a pretty fat, slow radioactive particle. So it is very easily blocked uh, by material. So the penetration is not very good. Uh, for dealing with unconsolidated alluvial deposits, we're maybe the upper couple of meters. If we're dealing with granitic hard rocks, you know, we might be doing five centimeters if we're lucky. But Mitch, what we're doing with this is we're actually looking. Excuse me, Mitch. Right. We've got a couple of questions. Oh. Um, I love it. So Justin Dury, Dury maybe you mentioned P waves earlier. I had an interruption for a couple of minutes. I might have missed it. But do you look at S waves or other waveforms for data? Uh, so MSR is tuned, I wouldn't say tuned, right? Because if you have an S wave that's crossing in the right direction, you are going to listen to it as noise. Um, so the way fundamentally MSR works, I'm not, I don't know if you missed that bit, but uh, we're essentially looking at the resonance acoustics or the trapped resonance between the surface and the whatever layers might uh, go beneath it. So if you have a straight S wave that goes down and then bounces vertically up into our sensor, we would collect it. But for the most part, the math behind it, why this works, it's mostly predominantly P waves. Hopefully that answers your question. The next, uh, the next question is from our Steve Cody. Uh, can you get additional information by monitoring both P and S wave arrivals? Okay, so we've thought about this and this is uh, getting into the, a little bit more of our R&D projects right now. So. In theory, and we've actually, we have one actually in my basement here. So I'm actually in Oregon in the Pacific Northwest and probably a two hour flight for me is our headquarters in Salt Lake City. Um, and we've essentially put a continuously monitoring MSR station in my basement to have like a geophone for, you know, earthquake detection or me stomping around the house apparently as I found out. And then also uh, we have one in our, one of our uh, geophysicist basements in Salt Lake. And we can actually see the S wave arrival difference. Um, so for example, if you remember quite a number of months back, we had that large uh, earthquake activity in Iceland. So it's interesting. We don't necessarily get like you would see on a, a traditional seismic graph of, you know, you have your P wave arrival quietness and then S wave arrival. What we see is an increase in the resonance intensity or the relative resonance on those MSR plots. So it's all grabs the saturation dial on a photo and cranks up the saturation for the contrast. Because what's happening is we're getting more background noise or more background acoustics in the earth as those P and S waves travel through. So that, that's kind of how it works for our sensor. It's not necessarily designed to see F S waves, but we can see the increased background noise that they cause as they transit through if they are significantly powerful. That's a little bit of an odd answer. I hope hopefully that answers your question. No, very good answer. I'm just um, going to shrink this Q&A box down. Okay, so back to you, Mitch. Should I move to the next slide? Yeah, I think the next slide will work because it shows the same thing, but just a little bit different. So going back to talking about um, kind of gamma scintillation. So scintillation, fancy way to say count. But what we're doing is we're looking for areas in which gamma rays are being blocked. Now we have to be careful when we do this because uh, things like asphalt roads will block gamma rays. Uh, concrete can block gamma rays. Um, if your farmer has decided to flood irrigate, well, that's water and that's gonna also block gamma rays. So we're not blindly trusting this. That's why we've also leveraged things like drone photogrammetry to look at uh, some of the moisture content from optics uh, through like the infrared spectrum. But what we're if we're using just gamma, the blue here represents areas of low gamma. So once this has been normalized and we filtered out as much as we can, we're looking for areas where those gamma rays are being blocked because that's indicative of areas that potentially have more water. And then we use MSR to go through and investigate those areas further. Um, so in this case, instead of a, a really large, expensive MSR grid, <clears throat> what we do 
is we just do uh, more simple and a lot faster to do cross sections. Um, so it looks like on this one, we did 10. So if we jump over to the next slide, what we're essentially doing is we're targeting those gamma lows and getting them with MSR to see if there could be reservoir potential. So MSR being really good at telling relative porosity through the relative resonance intensity, <clears throat> we're looking for you know low gamma and then also where is the is there reservoir potential? So we did know from this area that there was two aquifer zones. There was an upper and a lower aquifer. Now, we didn't want to really look for any targets within the upper aquifer zone because that's very drought prone. Um, apologies, <laughs> this is in feet. Uh, so we knew that upper aquifer is about 100 feet, so about 30 meters or so, uh, very drought prone. So we wanted to go for stuff that was around 300 feet or about 100 meters. Um, that's where the, the larger producing wells in the area are historically. So that was kind of our target depth. And you can see we get a pretty nice degree of correlation um, between you know a gamma low and a really nice structure within the microseismic data. Now, the geophysicists that I work with, um, they they stand on the side of that uh, the reason we get these larger gamma anomalies without a meteoric event, so a rainfall, is due to vertical soil moisture. Uh, what do they say? It's vertical moisture attenuation. So essentially, the movement of moisture from deeper down up through the earth. Uh, at a very minute rate, because the level in which we're measuring gamma rays are incredibly minute. Um, so I should mention that too. It's not like we're, you know, going out with a, an old timey uh, radiation detector. This is really high, high resolution kit. Um, so we're looking at these anomalies, and this is actually a target one. So we have a decent gamma anomaly with a pretty good, and honestly, the MSR is more trustworthy here, a, a very good possibility for a deeper porous structure within that deeper aquifer. So if we go over to the, uh, the second slide here, so this is more of a comparison. So I cannot tell you, you know, if you drill into this, you're going to get 10 liters a second of water. Uh, I'm not a magician. But I can tell you, um, for example, that our primary target is better than our secondary target. Um, so here, even though we have a really nice gamma anomaly, if you look at the MSR data, the upper aquifer is a little bit more, you know, a little more developed. There's higher relative resonance here, so higher relative porosity. Um, that could be partially, uh, maybe that's what's fooling our, our gamma data here. Maybe there's more water in the zone. But if you look at that deeper aquifer that we were targeting, you know, we do have relative porosity. That's cool, um, but it's not a lot of interconnectedness. So this is designated as a secondary target. Now, I don't have an example of this, but that's actually what's kind of cool, is if we have a well that already exists or a well that's gone dry, we can actually do a survey um, of, you know, we can do an X or we can do a tiny 25 point grid um, over an existing well, and then use that as baseline. So if you have a well that produces 10 liters a second of water, say, um, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you you're gonna get 10 liters a second if you get another well here, but it is a good uh, litmus test of, okay, we know what this well produces and what this looks like from a numerical standpoint, how does that compare to any new targets we find? And that's how we'll categorize targets on a larger investigations. So that's that. And uh, this is a similar graph to actually the one I showed you on that geotactical application. Um, just this is looking at relative resonance from an aquifer kind of investigation side of things that you could say. So we have our upper aquifer zone, not very well developed from a relative resonance standpoint. And then we have our deeper aquifer zone from the relative resonance standpoint. And these are T1 and T2, so the primary and secondary target, compared to the average of all the MSR data that was collected on the site. So of all the data, these are the best two. Obviously, target one being a little bit better, although a little bit deeper. So that's kind of how we use it for well site work. When I see a question, should we tackle it before we move on? Oh, another question. Yeah, hold on. Oh, it's elusive. Whoops. Sorry, I'm a bit of a rookie on. Uh, here we go. Oh, we got three questions now. Yeah. Oh, man. Man, kind of trouble. John Webb, what is the maximum depth that the gamma radiation is being recorded from? Ah, okay. I'm going to answer both parts of that question in case that's what you meant. So in terms of where it's being recorded from depends on the crystal size. 
now and this i'm not going to be all like witchy and like make you know give you a blessing with some fancy crystals but the the way gamma scintillation works is you have uh very special crystals with a special chemical identity some are cesium iodide or potassium iodide depends on how they're grown um but depending on the crystal size um so we have some crystals that are cubic centimeter so very small um for those you wouldn't want to go more than about waist high uh, we have some other crystals that are on the size of a liter. Um, so those are significantly larger, and those can be flown from a drone or a small light aircraft at uh, elevations between, you know, 20 meters and however high you want to fly. So as you get higher and higher from the ground, you're getting a more conical approach, right? Because you can, if you're at the ground level or the closer you are to the ground, you have less essentially incident angle from, you know, a stray gamma ray from, you know, 20 meters away hitting your crystal. It's more stuff that's right below you. So as you get higher up in the ground, your cone gets higher. Um, you have to do a lot more filtering. And this, but you have to also uh, do things with LIDAR search. You can use the LIDAR terrain to crop out your data. And there's some algorithms that run in the background. Um, I, I wouldn't go much more than 20 meters with the drone. Um, and a, a very good drone that follows topography. That takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. Um, and then if what you meant was how far do gamma rays come from in the ground, that depends mostly on what kind of ground we're dealing with. So if we're dealing with unconsolidated alluvial sediments, you might get a couple of meters. If we're dealing with, you know, solid bedrock, granites, basalt, something really, really dense, you're going to get a couple centimeters at best. Related question to that that John's popped in is what is the depth in the ground that the gamma radiation is being recorded from? Okay, I think we just tackled that. Um, but again, it's, you know, if we're dealing with unconsolidated, we're dealing with a couple meters, uh, sorry, yeah, a couple meters. And then if we're dealing with solid uh, structure, so, you know, granitic rocks, bedrock, you know, metamorphic rocks, something really, really dense. Um, density is not gamma's friends. So that's why, you know, lead shielding can be used or water itself can be used in nuclear reactors. It doesn't penetrate very well. And that's also why downhole geophysics use uh, gamma quite a bit because it's actually a very, very good way to uh, look at the geology as well uh, if you're looking at full spectrum gamma. Okay. Uh, Steve Cody, how does the presence of faulting and other discontinuities affect the results? I'm going to assume you're asking about gamma. Uh, if not, put another question in there and I'll adjust my answer. But um, okay. So there's a couple different types of gamma scintillation. There's total count gamma scintillation, which is all the radiation you measure, and you just plot that on the map. And that's what I showed you earlier. Now, if we we're um, actually, I can explain to you what we're doing in Brazil right now. So uh, Valet, one of our long-term clients, they're designing a new pit. Now, the geology from the area has not been well understood. Um, there's a pretty good map, actually, from the 50s, uh, from a mapping expedition that went down there to that region in Brazil. But uh, geology is not very good. Normally, you would send a geologist out there and address that. It wouldn't take that long. Give them a, a case of beer. You'd have it done in about a week. Problem is, this is all within a really densely forested area. And on top of that, it's also really steep. So what we're doing is we're using our drone with a, a very large uh, crystal in it. So we can fly it at around uh, five meters above tree canopy, which is nerve-wracking to say the least, but we're actually not measuring total count. Although we could, what we're looking at is the full spectrum of gamma. Now, it's a, maybe a little bit into the weeds uh, if you're not familiar with gamma and how that works, but a lot of different isotopes or a lot of different elements essentially will eject gamma rays. So that's cesium, thorium, potassium, some titanium, you know, radon, like in your basement, if you have a radon problem, all these different elements will give off some energy level of gamma. So it's it's almost like looking at light. And what we can do is let's take our, our gamma crystal and we can go sample a known piece of geology. So say it's a volcanic rock. That's going to be really high in potassium uh, just due to the volcanic crystals in that. So we can build a fingerprint of the potassium, the cesium, whatever elements are present in there. <clears throat> and we understand what that looks like from a full spectrum gamma side. And then let's go on the other end of that. We'll say there's a, a right? Well, that limestone is going to be very mute in potassium. It might have some other materials like cesium, which really just depends on how it was formed. Uh, but it's going to look significantly different from a uh, full spectrum gamma perspective than the 
uh, volcanic. So what we do is we fly that whole area on a grid with our drone back and forth, and we can plot the different areas of full spectrum gamma. And that gives us a relatively accurate geologic map, a very first glimpse as to what's going on from a geologic perspective under the tree canopy. And now if you have things like faults, um, let's say you have a fault that is um, full of fault gouge, uh, so broken up material, that might hold on to a lot of residual moisture. So you might get things that are, uh, you know, it might get an area that has a higher soil moisture content. So you might get a very low gamma signature within your body as well. So it's a little bit like looking at a one of those Rorschach tests. You have to kind of, firstly, you got to tell the computer what you're modeling. And then you also kind of have to understand uh, the regional his, uh, geology of the regional fabric uh, to interpret that kind of data. But it's been a very effective way to, you know, send a drone out and map you know, two, three, four square kilometers from a geologic setting very roughed in uh, versus sending some guys out, which could take significantly longer and very difficult to do. Very good, Mitch. Now I'm going to uh, discipline you a little. We're going to have to shorten those quick questions okay. or you're <laughs> right, going to run out of time. So I'll just um, go back to this. So I'm going to move to the next slide. All right. It was a good answer, Bob. So appreciate it. Yeah, that, that's actually one of my R and D projects right now. We're, we're very happy with how it's going. The ballet is ecstatic about how that's turned out. So we'll transition away from microseismic and from gamma. Uh, although we didn't talk about gamma very much, but as you can tell, I do love that tech. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Willow Stick method, and that's what the company's been doing for over twenty years now. Uh, since well before I was with the company. So let's jump over. I remember what the first slide for the Willow Stick stuff was. I definitely, I think it's like one or two out from this one. Okay, we'll start here. That's a good place to start. Oh no, too far. Go back. Go okay. Back so yeah, go back one. So if you know anything about resistivity and how resistivity works, it's not that. It don't don't compare it to resistivity. It's it's a something else. So I'll I'll put that out there because a lot of people like to say, oh, it's resistivity. No. So resistivity, you got you know multiple electrodes in the ground. You're doing maybe cross sections of the same tree, and you're testing the resistivity between your different electrodes. What we're doing is we're putting electricity into the ground with two electrodes, and we're surveying the ground between it. So you can see we have our circuit wire. I'll explain to you why it's so far away is because we're actually measuring the magnetic field that our electricity creates as it flows through the ground. Right off the bat, there's probably some people out there thinking, oh my God, interference has got to be terrible. We're using a certain frequency that's not a harmonic of the power grid. So we can pretty much uh, delete all that power grid noise because our instruments are tuned to listen to something that's not even remotely close to that. Um, so essentially what's happened is we put our uh, electricity, in this case is a tailings dam that was being built, we'll put electricity upstream in the tailings material in this case, and then our uh, uh, second electrode downstream. Uh, it is an alternating current, but you can think of it as flowing from upstream to downstream, and that electricity will preferentially follow areas that are more conductive, right? So if we're thinking about this, uh, dry earth doesn't really conduct electricity very well, if at all. Areas that are more saturated because they have dissolved ions, in this case, super conductive because they're full of uh, dissolved metals, uh, that's where the electricity will preferentially follow. So I, I will admit, you know, if we have a, a metal pipe that rips straight down through the middle of, uh, of a dam, that can cause some issues. In fact, uh, we did a project with HydroTerra that had a similar uh, issue. But uh, one of the benefits of that is a metal pipe is hundreds if not thousands of times more conductive than the actual earth materials that are conductive. So we can actually filter that out to some extent as well, depending on how severe that is. Now, in terms of the strength of that field we're measuring, uh, we're talking micro Teslas, or sorry, excuse me, pico Teslas. So that is around the energy or the magnetic field strength that your brain makes when you're just sitting there thinking. Uh, so this is very minute, and that's why the circuit wire is so far away. Um, ideally, trust me, I'd love it if that was true. Maybe just put a circuit wire straight through the middle of our survey, but it would blind us uh, completely. So if we jump over to the next uh, slide here, what we're what we're looking at is just a, a schematic, a cross-sectional view of kind of our approach here, how this works, like I was saying. So we put electricity upstream, flows downstream, 
and it's going to follow its preferential flow path due to where that water is present. So if we jump over to the next slide here, um, this is kind of the, the raw data and it is butt ugly. So this is, you know, this is what the instrument tells us. This is essentially the vector of that magnetic field. Now this is pretty impossible to difficult if you're, if you're lucky to interpret by itself. Um, now what this is essentially what we've done is each one of those red dots, you can see they're actually little red crosshairs. We actually take our, our survey instrument. It's got an integrated RTK GPS, a whole lot of fancy hardware, and it's designed to measure the vector of that magnetic field we've generated. So essentially, we're looking at vector measurements uh, in three dimensions, so X, Y, and Z. Um, and to collect that data, you know, it might take a couple hours to a half a day to set up a circle wire, and then each one of those red uh, crosshairs takes about uh, 15 seconds to collect. And we've actually since mounted this instrument on a drone to uh, capture our surveys uh, to cater to the Brazil market. Uh, so it's, it's pretty flexible. So if we jump over to that next slide. This is when it starts to get a little bit more interesting. So this is, this is what that magnetic field would have looked like uh, modeled out if there was no you know, preferential flow. So this is an imperfect homogeneous Earth, which it's not. Um, so if we take that measured data and divide it into this homogeneous Earth data as a background, this is what we're getting here. So again, this is pretty difficult to interpret. Um, but essentially, green is higher magnetic field or stronger magnetic field than we expected. And the pinks are the lower or weaker magnetic field. So obviously, our dam's wet. Um, this is a, a very interesting case. So this first survey was done uh, back in 2021. Um, and it was during construction. So they were losing thousands of liters of grout a day uh, because it turns out the super awesome straight valley they decided to build their dam in was there because of a fault um, that they somehow missed during their preset assessment. So that's where the grout was disappearing to. So if we jump over to that next uh, slide here, what we uh, essentially are looking at is a little bit more refined of that. This is on the log scale. Uh, so you can jump over again. And uh, this is a, uh, a view of you know, where that flow path is. And uh, this, is, this is a part where, do you want to jump over to the 3D model? And I can show that one. Yeah. I think this one kind of warrants right. it. You ready? I'll stop sharing. I'm ready. Brace yourself. Right. <clears throat> if I delete the whole stream, I apologize. I feel like it's been going good so far. OK, so I'll uh, go back to this. So, this is that raw magnetic field data. Let me turn off the uh, the second investigation. So this is that raw magnetic field data, right? This is where that electricity flows through the dam according to the magnetic field vector data. Now, this is cool, nice to look at, but uh, just like the stuff we were dealing with before with that karstic material, I can isolate areas that are the highest. So what we're looking at, this is essentially your seepage. Here's your problem. Clear as day. Um, this is um, all from that magnetic field data, and this is what we provided uh, to the client. I can actually tell you who this is. This was uh, for a Glencore site uh, in Canada, and this was, again, during construction, so this was allowing them to target where to essentially dump thousands more liters of grout uh, into the subsurface. Now, the cool thing is, and well, I'll, I'll stipulate, I can't tell you flow rate. Again, sorry, still not a magic person. But I can tell you where it exists. Now, the interesting thing is we did the survey twice. So back in 2023, after construction concluded, we did the exact same survey again. And that's what this is. So we use the same layout. We use the same power input into the ground. Then we collect the data at the same locations. And this is the resulting uh, ISO surface of that flow at the same value. So what we're looking at here is I can tell you that, you know, I, I, well, I cannot tell you that you have, you know, X amount liters a second flowing through your dam. But what I can tell you is that the magnetic field strength is 10 times weaker. Uh, so essentially order of magnitude reduced. So you can think of that in your head as a order of magnitude reduced in seepage. Now you can tell they was very successful in cutting off seepage over here on that left abutment. Uh, not so much on the right abutment over here, um, but they did have some, um, I believe it was a monitoring, I think it was a vibrating wire piezometer. Um, they, they were aware there's still seepage over here, 
but it was not at an amount that was concerning and it was within uh, regulations for Ontario. So what they had done is they essentially just installed a piezometer network targeted right along that flow path just to keep an eye on it. So it goes, where's the seepage in my dam? I don't know where this is coming from to, uh, oh, it's right here. Um, and I, I will show you this example very briefly. Um, this is just a, another survey. This is actually also in Canada, but in Nova Scotia. So a complete other side of Canada. Um, same deal as before that I was showing you. So we have our, our circuit wire as far away as we can get it because it'll blind us if it's too close. Um, our survey area, all our little measurement points, and then the actual data itself. So this is what, a again, a little 2D profile looks like. But uh, if I take that, so here's our tailing stand in the natural forest where uh, everything was seeping too. Um, I can actually, I'll show you these first. Um, those are the from interpretation. Now where those come from are actually this. So here's the raw data um, outside of LeapFrog. This is just another program. Um, but these are the flow paths themselves. And if I tilt this on its side, you can actually see the kind of design of the dam. You got the dam's crest here the slope and then the uh, downstream side of the dam. Um, we're actually able to very accurately, depending on how the survey is set up, uh, within three meters, four meters, uh, two meters, if we get really crazy with our survey design, um, I can show you where the seepage comes from uh, in three dimensions at depth. Um, so for this client, they just wanted these 3D polylines uh, so that they could design a, a drill system to essentially drill down and route where that seepage comes from. And, and that's that's pretty much what the willow stick method is used for. I'll stop sharing my screen here and you can take it back. But uh, that, that's pretty much what the willow stick method is used for. Um, our clients in Brazil, um, they do use it for uh, seepage investigations. However, they also use it for regional groundwater distribution studies. So resistivity will tell you the groundwater table. Willow stick will show you uh, concentration. So is there, is there more water here versus over here? Uh, so that, that's how the willow stick survey works. I think we can probably jump to the next slide here, but it's probably just a, a worst version of what I can get across in 3D. Yeah, that's more of that. So we can jump through these. Yeah, more of the same. And that, this is actually the, the mathematical version of the conclusion of uh, the two different uh, investigations based on 2021 and 2023 on uh, where that seepage was cut off, essentially, is what that shows. Those are directly from the report, actually, that was delivered. We can jump over to the next one. Yeah. So there's that. So here we are. All right. So... That was really interesting. We do have one more question that's popped up up the top, and we do have some early bird questions. So we might start with the early birds. Yeah. Just have to move your head aside so I can see them. <laughs> Wondering why MMR method seems limited to willow stick, no other options. Other geophysics equipment is available for rent. So is it available? So MMR, if you correct me if I'm wrong, is Meso Lamont. I'm not actually 100% familiar with that. So I'm a I'm a ge humble geologist. Um, I, I, if, I, if your question is, you know, I can go out and buy these other equipments. Um, MMR, I believe, is one of those. Um, also in the seismic world, you can go out and buy the Tribino system. Um, so MMR, it's out there. It exists. Um, Willow Stick is out there. It exists. Uh, but you do have to, uh, we don't just go out there and sell it. So all of our equipment is patented, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what side of that aisle you sit on. Um, and then also all of our back end is patented as well. So uh, that's why we have HydroTerra in Australia. They're a fantastic distributor for us and uh, they conduct all our field work. And it's also a lot better too. So Willow Stick, uh, fundamentally, you could think of it as a tech company. Uh, we continuously come out with new versions of our equipment. Um, so I think this year alone, we've gone through two equipment updates for Willow Stick. Uh, for the micro seismic side, we've gone through three. Um, so it would just be bad practice to build something, distribute it, and then to come out and suddenly there's a new version. Uh, sounds a lot like a tech company, um, but it's very hard to support stuff that becomes um, essentially out of date because we have 
equipment that uses battery type X, and we are now on battery type Z. Um, we designed stuff completely different, and then also the workflows change as well with these updates. Um, so we rely on our partners around the world to uh, keep their equipment up to date through us, and then they can go out and conduct the work. That's satisfactory of an answer. <laughs> I think so. Um, and why wouldn't you want to come and deal with us anyway? <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly, right? I'd rather side. have a professional lab on site. Yeah, Ruben exactly. does great work. Um, induced size necessity when rapid has created earthquakes, especially with the first filling of a reservoir. What are the prevention strategies? Mm, have you created an earthquake, Mitch? Personally, no. Um, so I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but it is probably the closest I have dealt with. So we're dealing with carbon sequestration in the U.S., um, so essentially carbon graveyards um, run by GE and Exxon. But what they've essentially decided to do is it's it's like fracking with gas, um, pump it down into the earth, so it'll let the gas itself. It'll then crystallize over a number of years. Um, they're doing this in Iceland as well. But uh, just like the fracking industry, that can change. So uh, I wouldn't use willow stick for this. Uh, I'm not actually very familiar with this happening in reservoirs. So it's very interesting. Uh, but in the fracking world, um, it does happen. And I'm familiar with this. So we've actually installed, uh, we've discussed installing, but we've actually done a couple MSR surveys in a grid over these large injection wells uh, at time A. And we've actually, uh, this is a pilot program we started about four months ago. Uh, right around the time the winter melts got done. So they've put in a couple new injection wells and we're doing a monthly measurement of the relative porosity using MSR at depth. Um, that's why we were doing oil well projects down to you know, four and 5,000 meters because our goal is to essentially monitor the areas of high relative resonance or the relative porosity, how that changes over time uh, because we strongly believe that we can measure that porosity as it changes in the fracking industry. And I think that'll be pretty revolutionary. So when we talk about induced seismicity, are we talking about induced by your measurement devices or other? Like, I'm not sure. So if, if we're worried about our equipment, you know, making making earthquakes. Um, so I didn't talk about this, but MSR is mostly passive seismic, uh, but it is, I would say, hybrid, active, and passive seismic. So we're dealing with this domain of, you know, higher frequencies being shallow work and then lower frequencies being, you know, deeper and deeper until we get below a hurt. That's really deep. Um, but to fill in that kind of high frequency near surface stuff, we do need an active source. Now, our active source is a, it's like a, five, 600 gram uh, rubber mallet uh, that we just literally tap the ground with, but well, about as hard as you gently bump your fist on the desk. Um, and that's enough that we get that uh, acoustic information for the upper 10, 15 meters or so. Uh, and then the rest is just background noise. So I don't really, I don't feel like we're gonna be causing any induced earthquakes with that. Um, not, I would be pretty shocked. <laughs> I'd be very impressed, Mitch. Um, right, yeah, I'm not that strong. Question number three, challenges for the technique. What environments does it not work in? Yeah, so if we talk about MSR, um, MSR has a challenge we've noticed so far, although it is acoustic based, it does get a, a frequency anomaly due to overhead high tension power lines. But the benefit of that is it's at one set frequency, so it's pretty easy to kind of just delete out of the data set. Um, I've used MSR personally down at minus 30 Celsius in the Arctic, and we've also used it in Brazil at 40 Celsius. So, uh, and that's also, you're going from frozen tundra to areas that are, uh, you know, incredibly hot and jungly. Um, I can tell you we did a survey on a wastewater treatment plant. Um, it does not work on solidified human feces. Um, it's too jello-like and uh, does not uh, transmit P waves very well. <laughs> That's what we found out. So maybe that would be the, you know, a muddy swamp. Um, we need to be able to couple with the ground to get a good MSR measurement. So you know, mud, that kind of stuff is, doesn't work very good. Uh, as far as willow stick goes, um, that being electrical based, uh, we mentioned the power grid thing. We have that pretty well handled. 
Uh, but if you have, um, I'll, I'll say, linear conductive features that are close to parallel between the two electrodes, that can be a pretty big hindrance uh, because, you know, instead of our electricity wanting to follow the water on the ground, it's going to want to follow, you know, conductive metal features. Um, the other thing that uh, willow stick uh, can potentially have some issues with is areas where we might have a very conductive um, clay, for example. Uh, what happens there is, you know, if we have a conductive clay and we don't have a very good understanding of its spatial position, it'll show up in the MSR data, uh, excuse me, the willow stick data, like sheet flow. Um, so if we take that uh, and we understand that there is a conductive feature there, um, obviously, you know, we have some clays that are uh, porous, so they might have macro porous. It's very, uh, very common up in Cape York. We've done some surveys for Rio Tinto up there. And although the clays are conductive, the areas where there's water within those clays is more conductive. So that's not so much an issue. Um, but if you get stacking, let's say you have a, for some reason, you have a very fine clay that is conductive um, underneath your dam, for example, and then you have a, a gravel layer above it. Um, most times, uh, because we're dealing with a three meter accuracy for willow stick, you know, we are going to see that gravel layer before we see that kind of larger, weaker, flat anomaly due to clay. Um, that really just depends on the chemistry of the clay. And then we actually have, um, we have a new grad student who joined our team from Montana Tech, and she's doing her entire dissertation on how bad those clay effects actually are. Uh, but they're, they're not as big of an issue. I would say the biggest issue is conductive metal features. Um, we can, like I said, we can filter those out to some extent, but, uh, you know, if you give me a, a dam, uh, uh, South America does this quite a bit, the upstream face will be completely covered in uh, metal mesh. Uh, that's incredibly difficult to filter out. We've had some success with that, but uh, it's mostly metallic metal features that hinder willow stick. And then uh, to wrap it up, gamma, we talked about this a little bit, um, asphalt blocks gamma rays. So if you're trying to do a nice study uh, or let's say very common, you're working on native ground and then someone uses a, a vehicle to grade a road or disturb the surface, that surface disturbance will sometimes change the gamma signature as well because you're kind of shifting things around. It disrupts that natural fabric. Uh, and that's when we have to leverage things like drone photogrammetry to build custom filters and custom um, algorithms that we plug that data into to essentially normalize everything, which is just a, a huge pain in the ass. But uh, that's how we tackle that. Okay, we've got one more question on the Q&A, Mitch. And it says from Joshua Meertens. How does that seepage detection method work in environments with lots of conductive clays? Okay, so we talked about that a little bit. I, I guess the question is, how much is a lot? You know, so uh, a, a good example of this uh, close to home would be the somewhat recent investigations you guys did in uh, New South Wales, um, just outside of Sydney. Those dams and a lot of dams around the world, they have a clay core, for example, right? Um, if we have seepage, the, those dams did not have this issue, uh, but we have seen it in some of the ones in other parts of the world where we have seepage that physically penetrates that clay core and then exits on the downstream side. So the area in which that clay, if it has area, you know, a physical zone where water is flowing through it, um, whether it's in macro pores or it's within some kind of area where we've had sediment removed due to this uh, liquid flow, that's going to be more conductive than the clay that's around it. Um, if we're dealing with some crazy hodgepodge of, you know, just some kind of messy clay situation, I'm, I'm not sure what that would look like to cause enough of an issue to completely negate all of the, the conductivity of the, you know, seepage itself. Um, but it's something, you know, when, when, before we go into a willistic job, we usually, what we always do, we'll sit down, if it's Hydroterra doing the work um, or another partner somewhere globally, it's, it's a three-way conversation of, you know, what is your site-specific issue? What are your concerns? What are you trying to do at the end of the day? And then maybe it's not just with a stick. You know, if you have an area, a dam, for example, that has crazy clays, uh, we might use a lot of MSR. That's what we did for Rio Tinto because we knew there was clays. So we leveraged to understand those clay lengths uh, very accurately, but about 40 centimeters. Uh, categorize all those different clays. There was four separate ones, and we also understood which ones the macro pores were present in due to drilling, and then also from the MSR data, 
And then we use that to kind of hone in the MS, um, the Willow stick data as well. So it just depends on the site. Uh, Josh, by a lot. Josh Meertens has said by a lot hypersaline salt lakes infilled with lacustrine clays, some groundwater flow localized to small areas of silcrete and calcrete. That's pretty specific, Josh. Um, that's a lot. It sounds, it sounds, it sounds like we need to have a phone call with Josh because he's got a problem he needs to see addressed. Um, yeah. To say the least, though, so hypersaline salt lake, okay, filled with clays. Gotcha. So dry lake bed full of salt. We put some clay in there. Groundwater flow is localized within areas. Indeed. All right. Let's get in touch. You, you me, and Hydroterra, we can have a chat. It sounds like quite the challenge, um, but I can tell you <laughs> one thing. We did a couple willow stick studies along the coast uh, for saltwater, uh, and those worked. So it might be a little bit of a conversation. Maybe it's a complex issue where we use a couple different things. Um, I don't know. It's not a no yet, but it's definitely a little bit interesting of an issue. Um, nothing here screams because, like, even if we, if we look back at the um, the mining example, it's not necessarily a clay uh, or a salt uh, necessarily. Uh, but a lot of those tailing materials, and uh, we can talk about the willow stick more technically here for a second. When we're doing, um, let's say, an earthen dam with culinary water for you know residential use, we might be putting about two hundred watts of power in the ground. Um, which looks like about 270 volts at one amp. Uh, we always try to survey an amp that helps with the, some of the back end stuff. Um, now, for example, so 270 volts to get one amp, um, that's actually pretty high for our scale. If we go look at an example at uh, a tailing stand, for, um, which has you know really fine, almost talcum baby powder type sediments, uh, that's filled full of processed water that has dissolved metals, uh, potentially residual cyanide, what have you. Uh, that has so many more dissolved ions within that, that it just becomes ultra conductive. And then our surveys, instead of being at 270 volts, we're down around 40 volts or lower. Uh, so it just depends. It might change the voltage output, but our amperage output would still stay around the amp. So it, it really it depends on a lot of site factors. Um, I can tell you from the jobs I've been involved with, which is probably it's probably 300 something willow stick jobs at this point, we have had some issues where clays were present um, and they like the issues we discussed, whether it's macropores, it looks like sheet flow, what have you, but uh, it's never been a, we're blind, we can't help you. So that's, that's what I'd say. Let's talk. So Mitch, probably I'll have the last question. Um, All so right. I've often thought that this sort of combination of technologies is a great way to locate monitoring wells better. You know, we have lots of um, hydrogeological investigations where we put lots and lots of wells in and try and join the dots between them. But this seems to me to be a good way to do it. So what would you be saying is the optimum way to go about the sequence of you know, hydro investigation, you put in a few wells first, then do, you know, your micro seismic or do you go straight? The willow stick's pretty expensive at like 100000 a pop. Yeah. Um, micro seismic's low cost. Uh, yeah. What would you recommend as the optimum way to design a monitoring network? So I can tell you what our our clients in Brazil have been doing recently. Um, so a little bit of background, we've been working with Valet uh, almost exclusively for helping design their monitoring well networks uh, since about 2017. Uh, so before I was with the company. And what we do for them is uh, for Valet and Cedro, actually, which is like a, a smaller competitor to Valet, um, but they share a lot of info. It's a very odd relationship. Um, but what they do um, is they'll do a, a gamma survey. And then they'll use that, uh, just like we're looking for a municipal well, actually. We'll do a gamma survey, follow that up with MSR, and then they understand, you know, the areas that are most porous. Because if, um, I have some examples I can show if you want to go down the rabbit hole, but we've had wells installed within maybe 40 meters, uh, not even maybe 5, 10 meters from each other. Uh, one will have higher porosity and one will have almost no porosity. Or the depth isn't deep enough as well. Um, so they've drilled into a structure that may be has porosity, but they go down a little bit deeper and then have a lot more porosity. So the understanding of that geometric distribution is really important. Um, you know, ideally money is no object. Um, 
I think the best thing you can do is just do a blanket grid of MSR data. Um, that's actually what we do for Valet. Um, we do it on a, a hectare by hectare basis, and we do it on a 10 to 20 meter grid, depending on if it's a critical or a non-critical area, uh, because their goal is to dewater the ground uh, for their pit operations. Um, and then we couple that with some willow stick as well. Uh, but those are, are long-term contracts that are also very expensive. So I would say, you know, if you're just trying to design a uh, monitoring well network, um, I definitely don't think uh, gamma is a bad idea to kind of understand where we maybe have the higher soil moisture content. Now you are limited to the penetration of gamma rays, which we discussed isn't very great. Uh, so you still need to follow up with some MSR. Um, you also don't have to do a grid. You know, if you have an area localized that you know you want to investigate or you want to put a well, we can kind of do a tighter survey around that and just kind of pin that down to where it best could be. Uh, or um, a good example, we have a, a project in Pennsylvania here in the U.S. that we're doing uh, for just an old coal ash landfill. Uh, sorry, a coal mine that they filled back in with coal ash. And they just don't know where the bedrock surface is uh, because they think the old quarry itself is just it's, the water's flowing along the bottom. Um, so we're just doing actual parallel lines of MSR and treating it like reflective seismic so we can understand that bedrock interface. That way they can just pick the low spots and put in their well. So I think the best tool for that kind of job would probably be MSR and then maybe implementing some gamma here for cheaper stuff or willow stick if we want to go a bit crazy. Well, Mitch, thanks very much for your time today. It's been uh, really impressive to see your depth of knowledge and um, <laughs> really appreciate, appreciate our partnership with Willow Stick. Um, I think uh, this tech talk's been fantastic and uh, certainly provided people with how this technology can be used to help them. So many thanks for that. If uh, yeah, Thanks for having, that, honestly. Any chance I get to sit down and actually talk about what I do, like I can't do that at home. My spouse could care less what I do for work. So it's like, <laughs> what you do today? It's like, I have no idea what that means. So uh, I'll take the opportunity to chat a little bit about it. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We love working with you guys. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Cheers. Bye, guys.